we'll be inviting the applicant to, um, or his or her representative to present the application. Um, then there will be uh, a period of time for board members to ask questions that board members have of the applicant. Uh, after that, uh, we will invite members of the public to comment uh, to the extent they want to by raising their hand, quote unquote, in the bar at the bottom of the screen and having the chair recognize them. Um, uh, we're also assisted today, of course, by Carolyn Mish, the uh, from the Office of Planning and Sustainability as the staff person. And I think uh, Carolyn will be assisting with recognizing the people who would like to comment on the application. Um, once the public comment is over, and, by, and we ask that the comments be addressed, it's a little weird to say this when we're all virtual, but addressed to the board, not to the applicant. It makes more sense when we're all in the same room, but we like the questions to be directed and comments to be directed to the board. And then the board has the opportunity to uh, ask further questions to uh, of the applicant. Um, once the public comment period is over, uh, the board uh, typically will vote to close the hearing unless there's a continuation. Uh, and at that point, the public hearing is over and the chat box and raise hand functions will be turned off. Um, after that point, after that vote of the board is taken, the board is not able to receive any more uh, testimony or evidence from the applicant or the public. Um, and then depending on, on, on what happens between now and then, the board may or may not move uh, to vote on uh, the matter before us. Um, before I start, um, we always ask if there's any member of the public here for the purpose of addressing comments to the board that do not relate to the one application on the agenda today and just for the record, that application is um, the appeal of the building commissioner's decision by Pat Melnick, senior trustee of the Beaver Brook Nominee Trust and Raul and Farah Mata. Um, that decision of the building commissioner found that a, a certain lot is not a building lot at the end of Grove Avenue, the uh, tax ID, uh, a number of that lot is 5-12. But before we get to that, the question is, is there any member of the public here who would like to address the board with comments that do not relate to that one item on our agenda? And I guess, Carolyn, I'll ask if you see anyone raising their hands for comments that are unrelated to today's item, just general public comment. I don't see any. Okay, seeing none. Um, we will go ahead, I think, and uh, let me make sure I haven't missed anything else that I should have said. I think that covers things, unless anyone else can think of anything else that I did not mention. Uh, so if not, we'll go ahead and hear the presentation by the applicant, or in this case, his representative. Uh, on the matter that's before us. And once again, that is the appeal of the building commissioner's decision that I just referenced a moment again. And again, for the record, the notice of this hearing is published on May 13th and May 20th, 2021. So we'll ask the uh, applicant or the representative of the applicant to present to the board, please. Uh, hello uh, to the board. Uh, I'm attorney Salowski and I represent um, the applicant and um, Pat Melnick Sr. as trustee of the Beaverbrook Nominee Trust. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes, I think so. All right, great. So um, we'll get started as you guys are aware. And I just want to double check um, with Carolyn. I had sent an email over with some attachments just to be sure everybody had those. Um, have, has the board been able to get those? Um, so that as I can re um, relate to things, so we can look at them all together. Um, so the, um, it sounds like everybody does have those. So the uh, lot- Excuse me, attorney. I just want to make sure, Carolyn, we'll be able to show those on screen sharing to 
members of the public who are present who have not had may not have had an opportunity to see those attachments? Um, I can make um, Attorney Solovsky um, a co-host for the purposes of sharing. So, which I will do that now. I'm Is not sure something... if I can do that. I, I just printed them out. I could show people if oh. I, I, I don't know. Um... You can't come to a Zoom without sharing your screen, buddy. <laughs> I don't know how that works, actually. But um, in any event, if, when we get there, uh, if people have questions and they want to look at things, I guess we can deal with them. Okay. So um, I can. Um, so in that case, since he's unable to do that, I can. You can try and I can file. try. I, well, I can I, try it. Well, I can go ahead and um, I will pull up the folder that has them in them, but it it'll take me a couple of minutes, so I just need to go grab that folder and um, and uh, I'm sorry, um, um, get them on my screen. Um, uh, but go ahead. Yep. All right. So in, in any event, uh, the lot we're here to deal with is uh, a lot that's. Um, down towards the end of where Grove Ave is currently built out on the on the left side as you're looking to maps, it would be on the western side of Grove Ave. And Mr. and Ms. Mata want to build a home on this lot, and it's uh, a lot similar size and um, to the other lots in the area. It, it is along um, Grove Ave. And Grove Ave in this section was um, originally um, laid out in, as Washington Heights, and I don't know if anybody can see it, um, but I'll hold this up for a, a moment. And it, this um, map is a recorded map. Um, if everybody's able to look in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, it's Plan Book 32, page 38. This was laid out and recorded um, prior to the current um, zoning requirements. And this laid out Grove Ave as a, as a street in Northampton. And this um, Grove Ave goes beyond where... Um, yeah. Oh, there we are now. And so this street goes beyond where currently there are houses located, but where there are currently lots. And this lot is one of those um, areas uh, on that map um, in question. And uh, which lot is the one? So which I believe it's a combination, actually, but the street is so it would be on the north side. You see where it, along where it says the railroad. So I think it's actually. Um, a couple of these lots put together. Um, and I believe it may be one, two, and potentially three. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. I've been focusing on Grove Ave itself actually. And uh, that's kind of the, um, the issue in question is whether or not Grove Ave is, is a legal street that provides legal access. And, um, and this unquestionably goes well beyond um, the current, um, the lot in question of um, 05-012. And um, we've I'm, actually- I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I really wanna get my bearings on this because I've been up to the area, I've looked at it and I'm just confused now. I thought we were looking at the west side of Grove Ave and now you're talking about the north side. And as oh, I'm sorry, as... did I say north? I meant the top. Um, okay. So, the so that's west... the east side. Is that not the east side? No, the top of this map would be the um, would be the west side, and I'm sorry I, I misspoke if I said north. I meant the okay. Top. So you're you're in the far right corner where it says 52 on the top. Is that right? No, I think we're in, in, in underneath where it says railroad. You're talking about lots one and two. Uh, yeah, I think we're in that area um, of this map, and and they don't exactly line up to exactly what's. Um, on the ground now as um, some of these lots were combined in various different forms. But essentially that um, shows the continuation of Grove Ave, which is the, the important part of, of this and that this was a recorded plan um, in, the, in the registry of deeds at, prior to any current, um, the current rules and regulations okay. regarding zoning. Again, I, I know you're trying to just say Grove Ave is longer than it appears to be right now, but I need to get oriented to where you're talking about. I had been under the impression, the last house I saw on the left as I went down Grove and it dead ended was number 88. Um, are you talking beyond 88 on that same side or across yes. from 88? Beyond 88 on that same side, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight listed. 
so it's beyond the current um, houses that's there. What? So you're saying 88 is approximately here where my yes. cursor is? Yes, that's my understanding. So all those lots to the right of where Carolyn's got her little thing. Yes, you're that's currently 12, you're, 31, you're and 11. Are, you're arguing those are buildable lots? Yeah, so Grove Ave on this map in whatever year this was, in 1908, showed those as lots and so showed Grove Ave that long. Am yes. I getting this correct? Okay. Yeah, so it showed Grove Ave that long. So that established Grove Ave as a legal street in that length. And essentially, um, even though it may not have been built out at that time, it established that that was a legal lot. And now these lots on the uh, on the top one through eight are now um, on the on the tax maps um, map 0, 05, 11, 31, and twelve. So 0, 05, 11, 0, 05, 31, and zero five twelve. And now today, those abut the bike path, correct? They abut the, yeah, the, the bike path, I guess. Well, I think they call it the multi-use trail. I call it the bike path. It's shorter. <laughs> okay. The but bike I, path. We're taught, we're at least saying, talking about the same thing. Yes. So okay. that's currently uh, commonly known as the bike path. Thank you. Uh, okay. Go on. Sorry. Yeah. I kept interrupting. I no, just have had right a ahead. really hard time getting oriented to all of the locations of all no, of them. No, you get right ahead. You go right ahead and ask any questions that you've got to ask um, regarding that. Or, or any other questions you've got. So I've also got an exhibit B, which is a little bit wordy. It's, it's a, um, my exhibit B is actually a, a legal case that's dealing with this issue where some people may say, well, what does a street from 1948 have to do with now? Well, this, this case is, um, is a, a appeals court case and it establishes that once this street is laid out and people have rights along it, people own these lots and things like that, even though the street hasn't been built out, the town can't just unilaterally say, no, we're not um, going to acknowledge this street anymore and we're going to deny your permit. And very analogous to this situation, uh, in this case that's attached as Exhibit B, the, um, the building uh, department denied a building permit. The ZBA in this case actually um, upheld that denial. However, the Superior Court in this case um, overturned that denial and said, no, because there was this paper street, because they had frontage on this paper street, you can't deny them that. It was actually appealed to the appeals court where the appeals court actually upheld that decision. And the appeals court said, that's correct. Because this paper street was there, because there was this frontage on this paper street, it now legally, the town can't just decide that we don't want to do that anymore. Um, the, the, it, it is legal thing that's there and they have that right. And, um, and this, this case goes to that and it is a little bit hard to understand for some that aren't attorneys and it's, you know, it's wordy and, and frankly, a little bit confusing, but that is what, um, that says, and that's something that the, uh, the appeals court of Massachusetts had previously decided that these rights are protected in a case such as this. Even though, even though the paper street from 1908 or whenever it was, uh, was never at least the stretch we're talking about that fronts on, on the locusts in question, was never either built out as a road in the conventional sense with all the requirements of a municipality for safety and otherwise for such a road. And even though the uh, um, even though the, 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 you know, there's nothing other than a bike path under that theory, couldn't anyone with land on a paper street that has no actual road on it say, um, here's my frontage building commissioner. I mean, I think that is kind of the purpose of a paper street. And they did actually address the fact that it was not built out in this case. And they said, that's not a reason for this denial. And even if they want to take this um, where the plaintiff was content to abide by the town's regulations as to construction of ways, his rights as to this lot um, should not depend on the timing and construction of the way. So if there are some minor things that need to be done, um, that doesn't um, necessarily mean that they can deny that permit. Now, we feel that based on what's currently there, especially and if people have visited and it, it, this is shown on um, 
you know, just looking frankly at, at the picture, you can drive right up to the slot. I mean, you get in your car and anybody can go drive right up to it. The legal right to drive up to it. And, and I know everybody says, well, it's a bike path. However, that bike path was, was given to the city. And in that gift to the city, an easement specifically retained was the right to use it for vehicular access and utilities and all these things for, um, for the public purpose, for not public purpose, but for the private purpose of these homes to use for uh, single family home construction. And that right was specifically retained. So even though the general public has a, a right of access as bicycles, the owners of this property had retained an easement, retained um, as part of giving that easement, the right to, to access through that lot. And that is- um, That yeah. strikes- that strikes me as a little circular though, when in reading this easement, it says he reserves the right to use the easement for all purposes for which a right of way may be used. So I think, I think it, it would have to be determined that the right of way could be used for, for that. I, I, I don't think so. So basically with this easement, they gave to the, to the city certain rights, but reserved all those other rights. So they retained all those other rights in, in, in themselves in giving this. So they specifically reserved those rights and did not give away the right to the city to restrict vehicle access. So specifically, the city does not have the legal right to restrict vehicle access to this parcel. The, the city has obtained an easement for, for um, use as a, a multi-trail, multi-use trail, what commonly you guys would say is the bike path but the the owners have all the other rights in that so is that part of the development plan for this lot to turn that stretch of the bike trail into a road well i think just the and if you look at the original sec um the, the original section what is currently there there's about 20 or 25 feet which is the same width as the road and I think the, the idea is essentially just to have the driveway to this, this home that would be allowed there to be right on that last section, which is already the same width as the road. Uh, and that could be seen on, um, there's a plan for Beaver Brook. And if you excuse me, what exhibit that is, exhibit D. D. Yeah, that'll make it easier to look at. Exhibit D, it's fairly, you know, it's fairly small, but if people zoom in, they can see it is shown on there that the road itself is a certain width and it does continue that same width onto this property, which is what people would say is the bike path past that point. It does get narrower, but, um, you know, we don't think any, any real construction needs to be done besides having the a driveway that, um, to this property go there. And it, it's really essentially the same as the rest of Grove Ave. So on exhibit, um, E, uh, um, again, it, our lot is which uh, is it number twelve? Yes, lot we're twelve. So Exhibit E is a prior um, a prior granted. Um, yeah, I'm sideways here on E. So E was. I this is Exhibit nine. D. Um, it, did you? Are want we talking D or E? Right well, now? I have D, D up. But I thought I heard you say D. So which one? I thought are you I heard. Have? I thought I heard David say E. Are we doing D? I'm sorry. D is in David. D. Yes. D is in dog. Sorry. 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 Okay. D is in dog or David. Okay. If if we zoom in there on Grove Ave, we can see it is shown where the uh, where the current asphalt is, and it does show the the width of it, Grove Ave generally with the asphalt. And that continues for about 20, 25 feet, additionally onto what would be in front of this lot. And at the same width as the current uh, Grove Ave for the rest of the length. Carolyn, can you put your cursor over where? Um, I'd say it's right in the middle is essentially, yeah, right there, right in the middle. So, so I just want to correct that. This is not the width of Grove ends. Um, actually before the property line, um, it ends about right here because this was never built. This map that's in front of you um, was an earlier plan um, of where the bike path um, was going to be, where Grove was gonna be extended. So this doesn't exist, this block here. So the actual street ends right here. 
And where is and that house number 88 in relation right to? Right here. Okay. And the, uh, and the garage is to its left as we're looking at it. Okay. I, I think from what I understand, and actually from exhibit F, it, it is wider. And, and that does show um, on exhibit F, uh, you can just see a little corner of, it's actually a picture. I don't know how that's going to come out on your end, if it'll come out in color, but you can see how it is wider in one section. Um, and that shows the public notice hearing um, placard on the, um, on the yeah. property itself. That, that wasn't, show you the different widths. So that wasn't formally created as part of the street. The street's only been accepted to this point. And then there's right of way beyond that. This may be some just leftover stationing area for the from the construction of the bike path, but it certainly hasn't been improved to the standard of a street. Right. Plus, it doesn't stay that width up until the bike path. It 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 uh, in front of 88, it, there's it's almost right. like a cul-de-sac and then it narrows to 10 feet. Then there's right. this little tiny little space that bumps out a tiny bit and then it goes into the bike path, the 10 feet. Right. So yeah, that, that's correct from what I saw today. It ends yeah. there. But even if it ends there, what I'm hearing is that the terms of this easement which is exhibit C that was that were accepted by the city of Northampton. I'm not making an argument here. I'm just think mm -hmm. talking, describing out loud what I think I'm looking at. Um, is that at the time that the owner of this land granted this, what sort of became the rail trail to the city, the owner of the land reserved the right to an easement over that same strip of land for any purposes for which a road could be used, including, which means the question is, does that mean that it doesn't matter what the width of the pavement is now, it doesn't even matter how far the publicly accepted road for Grove Street is, the Grove Avenue, it's because the applicant or the appellant is the successor to this party. I guess maybe it's the same entity. It's a trust, the Beaver Brook nominee trust. That, so the appellant reserved the rights at the time this strip of land was transferred to the city to basically put in a roadway. I, Essentially, it, yes. So, you know, the reserve the right and the, is that nothing else matters because they reserve the rights to to make this a roadway to provide access and drainage utilities, et cetera, to install any other utilities that may be used in connection with single family homes. That that's that's what you're saying. But yes, that is essentially my first argument. We've got the we've got the right to do this. Um, and and the, the city accepted this easement, the city accepted those terms when it accepted that easement. Now the city's got the right to use this as a bike path, but we have the right to use this as a road. Carolyn, as a driveway. Um, so I guess, um, so I guess there are two things. One is, um, the, of course, in any easement, you can grant yourself exceptions to access property. So there's nothing that the city would do at the time to say, no, you can't continue to allow yourself access to the property. Um, and it certainly didn't grant um, compliance with the zoning for a lot frontage or um, access. Um, and then finally, the edge the the road ends 37 feet before this easement starts so um there's still a section of right of um access that is not it's unimproved access for the purposes of creating frontage if you even get to the point that we allow frontage off of the um end of a street i understand that the uh, applicants arguing that they have that a paper street provides them frontage, but in fact, this lot has been chopped up so many times that I, that original layout doesn't exist anymore. The planning board also 
approved um, an ANR uh, prior to this showing um, frontage only from Haydenville Road for all of this land here, which was in my staff memo and I can show that. Um, so that Paper Street essentially, um, if it was there in 1908, the subdivision road was actually created to this end. And so, and then there's been many carve ups of the remaining lot since then. So um, it's, I don't think it's a clear path to say that you're gonna use a 1908 plan that's still valid in 2021 when all these other changes have been made and the street has been accepted up to this point. I think the courts have disagreed with that. Uh, and I think the courts were clear in that case that I, um, I cited that, the, you know, essentially the courts say that, that paper street, even though, and I think it was 1948, but even though that was in 1948, that's still is valid today. It's a recorded legal document that says this is, this is what it is. Um, and, and after that, the cities and towns had more regulations on whether or not streets would be accepted because, I guess they, you know, zoning obviously in, in 1940s was not what it is now. And, um, but if something was done, you were grandfathered in and you were protected and your rights were protected in those streets and those paper streets. And, um, and this lot is one of those. And that's a necessary part of your argument, I'm asking, because it's not enough to say you've reserved easement rights because, uh, Carolyn, I, I don't think that you can claim frontage that necessary to satisfy the ordinance and the dimensional requirements for a building lot. You can't claim frontage on an easement based on an easement, a uh, frontage on an easement area. So is, does that mean that this second prong of your argument that, well, it's not just frontage on an easement area, which did give us the right or you the right to installed an access way, a roadway, or use it for all purposes for which a roadway may be used. But because a frontage on, on an easement is not enough, you also, or you're asking us to also find that this paper street from 1948 causes that strip of access land to rise to the level of a, of a, of a public way so that the frontage requirement is satisfied in that way. Do you, are you, do you think that, let me ask you this, do you think that, let's forget about the paper street for a minute. Do you think that having frontage on an easement area satisfies versus frontage on an actual accepted public way satisfies the requirements for frontage to make a building lot build, a lot buildable? So I think I'll take that question and give you a, a, not exactly a straight answer in that if it were a private easement, no, I, I don't think the private easement would give them that right. However, in, in addition to all those arguments, this is a public way. Um, the easement has been accepted by Northampton as a public way. And now they've accepted it as a public way as a bike path or multi-use trail, but that is a public way that the city of Northampton has accepted in addition. So we've got, my argument is actually not necessarily numerous prongs, but it's in numerous ways, um, depending on which way the board views things, I think we've got the right to build on this lot for numerous reasons, whether or not they um, accept the fact that this was a public, uh, a public way, which I think it was, and it was a paper street and it was accepted, even if that were not the case, and it, now it's a bike path, it's a public way that has now been accepted by the city of Northampton, and the right to access this uh, by vehicle were reserved to the uh the granters in that easement so if but there wasn't a street there originally which we say there was and we say that that was there even if that was just land and the city of northampton said we will accept this land as a public way the public has the right to go across this way for purposes of an easement of for um for a bike path, the, the grantor reserved the right to access it for more than those reasons, even though it is public for many reasons, it's, it's public, it's public way. So you're Whether saying not, on the one hand, if it were a private easement, no, that doesn't, we all agree that does not constitute frontage for these purposes. 
But you're saying because an easement was granted to the city for what is now the bike path, that makes it also a quote unquote public way? Yeah, I, I think there's no question that an easement, that a public easement is a public way. Well, that's the question. What What is, for, for purposes of the zoning ordinance, and I, I'm sure we can look it up, the definition of a public way, is it satisfied merely by virtue of the grant of private property to the town for a right of way? Or is, a, in my mind, a public way was always a street that has been accepted pursuant to the statutory process to accept a, to accept a street. Um, but I, I don't know if Carolyn has any uh any insight on that, but. Uh. Yeah, I, I guess um, a couple of um, questions. I mean, we have an easement for the public to access for bicycle. But is, but is that a leap and, to saying that makes this a public way for purposes of frontage? No, That's the city has not accepted this as um, a way um, for, um, a way on which frontage can be obtained. So I can read the three standards from the zoning for what constitutes frontage. Um, but I also, um, before I do that, I just wanna understand um, the plan you showed recorded at the registry. I see a date of 1908 on it and it doesn't, it's not clear that this has been accepted as a paper street. It may have been platted without intention, but in 1934, the city accepted Grove Avenue up to the point where it is now um, paved. So I don't know that even if you plat a paper street, the city has actually accepted that as the public way, even if it's unimproved. But um, so um, think about that but here is the definition from the zoning for frontage is the uninterrupted length of a front lot line is defined whether straight or not which conforms to the minimum lot frontage required and is on either a a public way or a way which the city clerk certifies is maintained and used as a public way for the purposes of street access a way shown on a previously approved subdivision plan, which has been constructed to the standards required when subdivision approval was granted, or a way that predates subdivision control that has in the planning board's opinion, suitable width grades and construction adequate and reasonable for vehicular traffic, including emergency vehicles, snow removal vehicles and installation of utilities. So let's say that the, you know, so I think um, the first question is whether or not that's even been accepted because we know it's been accepted from uh, previous court cases and um, a dis um, board of survey vote in the 30s up to basically 88 Grove, that area. Um, and the rest of it is unimproved. So even if there was an argument that there may have been um, a way that predates the subdivision, um, control, it's not been determined by the planning board to be adequate as meeting the standard for frontage. By, by the Northampton planning board. Right. So attorney Soslovsky, is that something that you can, uh, that you dispute that? I, I mean, you, I dispute that it's not a public way. I, I mean, I no, think- No, 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 about, no, no, no. We're just talking about whether or not it was accepted. No, I mean, I think it was accepted. This this plan was was recorded. It was prior to the subdivision control, and, and I think this is this street is. What constitutes illegal. acceptance, Carolyn? Um, the the city um, takes a vote to accept a way as a public way for the purposes of um, you know, maintenance, frontage, and all of those other items. You, Nate, you mentioned a 1948 um, map. I don't see that on this map. Oh, maybe I was showing. wrong. Maybe I was reading that wrong. So okay. is it? Because the subdivision, it subdivision control came into effect in 1945, I believe. So um, I, this, I think I was, it was small. I think I was misreading. So well, it says it was accepted for recording in 1948, but the date on the plan is 1908. I think that's the discrepancy. Oh, um, that could be. But anyway, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. But accepting for recording doesn't mean it's accepted it, by the city, right? Of course. Yeah. 
Okay. Right. So, so in that process that Carolyn just described, had, was there anything that you have going back to 1908 showing that that's a process the city engaged in to accept it? Not just recording it, which is what you've already said, but I, I don't think that that wasn't the process at that time. And that's where this this court case that I've cited, it gets into that, whereas that paper street, um, as the process of, uh, has changed, the legal process for accepting streets has changed, old streets are still legal, even if they were just paper streets, even, even if a if new current street has not been accepted and everybody drives down it all every day. It's possible. There are streets that people drive down every day, which have not been accepted. They okay, were old we, streets and they're legal. What we seem to have that, and I, I have to admit that it was just a sort of a cursory review of that case because there was a lot that you mm -hmm. attached, but was, was there, we seem to have a superseding vote on the part of the city. Um, I forget what year Carolyn just said, 1934. Um, to accept the road up to a certain point, which is much, much before what you're, you're suggesting from the Washington Heights map. Is there anything in that case that talks about that superseding acceptance process and how that affects the prior paper map? I mean, I don't think the, the city accepting something else means that this is not, um, not no, I legitimate. I I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree with you on that, sir, because if there is a um, codified process for how you accept a, a street and the city has engaged in that process in accordance with the process, then I, I'm not sure that I would necessarily think that um, the, the case would suggest that that's in, that can be outweighed by just the recording, an earlier recording. I mean, I don't think this case exactly goes to that point, but I think the city accepting, you know, street over in this location, I don't see how that affects street over in this location. Um, whether or not what they did on another portion of the street, they didn't address this portion. Uh, and, and I think unless there's some record, which well, I'm unaware it, of, there they specifically... Um, well, I have to assume they are uh, they when they went through the process of accepting the street up until a certain point, they were aware of the map of which you speak. I, I, I wasn't there. We none of us. I, I, I there. wasn't there. So, but I I have to assume that, especially given how much closer in time they were to <laughs> when they went through this process to the actual map itself than we are now, that they had to have been aware of it. They wouldn't have. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just speculating, of course, but I, I have to assume that this information was in front of them. You know, I can't say what was, you know, what right. was or not. None of us can. You're right. Time. You're right. None of us can. But so, um, I, would, but I would like to think of the city as thorough in this process, um, in, in looking at, you know, why, why did they choose this point? Um, so anyway, proceed. I'm sorry. I, I just... <laughs> No, I hang on to that, Elizabeth. Um, may I? Sure. Thank you. Um, so there's uh, the first thing I'm reminded of is um, a uh, a building lot, a similar discussion for a building lot on the north side of Florence that was uh, using the end width of a dead end paper street as their frontage. Um, hmm. Uh, within the last 10 years. Carolyn, you recall that one? Are you talking you about Dewey Court? You're not no. talking, that's not Florence. No, uh, um, uh, you get at it. Uh, Garfield? No. Um, uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it, it's similar. It's in that little nook on the side of Strawberry Hill, west side Strawberry Hill. You can see the lot but you're coming at it oh i can i'll have to pull up a map but okay. in any case sorry <laughs> there was a similar um situation where someone said you know this is a building lot and our access is the 50 foot width at the end of this dead end oh street we you oh you're talking about hillcrest ah yes thank you yeah um so um so it seemed like there was 
there were two things going on there. Uh, one of them was that that they were told that the uh, the width at the end of the road couldn't be used as frontage, which uh, we have a similar thing here. Um, and the other piece is that uh, it's it's certainly interesting for me to look back at maps that somebody drew in 1908, chopping things up into lots of tiny, tiny lots. Um, what I think is more pertinent here is the more recent subdivision approval that shows the current property line for this map five, lot 12, which is a funky shape where lot 12 plainly owns what used to be part of the paper street. In fact, which exhibit pieces. are you looking at? Um, uh, let's look at pulling that up. D. Exhibit D, the plan of Beaver Brook. Um, so the this being a subdivision approval plan. Uh, it was an ANR plan, excuse me, which was very much tied into lots of conservation easements and um, interesting negotiations. But I'm looking at what is lot 12, uh, pl remaining land of Patrick J. Melnick, trustee, et cetera. There's also a couple lots, perhaps former building lots, uh, immediately north of that, um, one by um, uh, Joseph Eli Boisvert and Bernard Prusinski, um, which plainly, maybe they were on a paper street before, but that what was paper street is now owned by lot 12, Patrick J. Melnick, trustee of Beaverbrook Nominee Trust. Looking, looking at this lot 12, it's this funky shape, correct? Yes. So the lot 12 is essentially a square, but it also owns the fee interest under which the, um, the easement and the bike path are on and the easement for the access. So while and it does own that, it, that is that there's an easement across that. So essentially it really is just the square on the side that's similar in shape to it's the- It's not surveyed as a separate lot. This is a subdivision of- this is this is a plan, a surveyed plan of a lot mm -hmm. of a funky shape, right? It, essentially, it's a funky shape. Yeah. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll and, give you and that. And whether whether or not there's an easement across it, um, it to me uh, the argument goes to whether or not it has frontage at that whatever fifty foot width or whatever that width is. I don't, can't see the scale exactly at the okay. end of the functioning Grove Avenue. So it does have act, uh, 50 feet at that point. And that is, I think my, one of my last points in this, even if all these other things are, um, you know, it, even if the board looks at all these other things and isn't sure there is a, a 50 feet across there as that's kind of our, um, our, our last Alan, position. Can you put your cursor over where um, the reference is now to that 50 feet? Right, right there, yeah. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on my own because I wasn't able to see that. Do it again. Uh, well, I'll zoom in. It's um, okay. right here. So actually, I'll just highlight it right there. Oh, that's a good idea. So it was laid out 50 feet wide. So it's there's mm -hmm. 50 feet there. Mm -hmm. wait, so, wait, 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 wait. That's parallel to the street? No. Uh, perpendicular this way. So, um, how about a line instead of a blue square? But that's not 50 feet there. That's just the um, width of the road, right? Which is 50, this, laid out 50 feet. Right. It's not improved as 50 feet, which we require improved frontage to count as frontage. It's only about 23 feet wide, but the right of way here is about 50 feet where this red line is. Does everybody see this red line? Yes. Yeah. And it's X number of feet away from the end of the actual road. Right. Yeah. About 37 feet. 
Okay. Thanks. Um, no, now, what do you mean when you say the actual road? The improved that? road. Up the, to the point that the city accepted it. Yeah. No, pavement, right? Right, but that's also the accepted extension. I see. So um, the, there's a um, gap. So, so there's a there's gap, a gap right. between the, the uh, appellant's locus and the right. edge of the accepted public way. Right, it's uh, about right here is the point at which uh, approximately, it may, be, it may be somewhere more in here, but this is the edge of the um, improved way as a street um, yeah. for the purposes of providing frontage. Um, and then everything, this 37 feet from this point to the property line is, there is a 10 foot wide bike path, but that's not been determined as an improved way um, on which the planning board has determined is suitable to constitute frontage for a property. So the planning board in a sense has, in, a, in an indirect way, has already looked at this question. It may or may not be dispositive. And they, as part of their approval, they determined, the planning board determined that, that the only qualified frontage is basically elsewhere. Is that correct? Uh, right. So this other um, plan here um, was an A and R plan um, where these lots were proposed to be carved up. Um, this is from 2003, I believe, from the uh, Beaverbrook Nominee Trust Surveyor from 2000. I, I'm sorry, the date is um, uh, mm -hmm. fuzzy. It's three, I think. And so all, you see all these lot lines here were frontage from Haydenville Road um, and the planning board determined at that time that was the frontage for all of this land. And this goes back to pre Beaver Book construction of the 28 um, homes, 26, 28 homes up there. So this was determined, all of this land here was determined to have frontage from Haydenville Road, not from Grove Avenue. Now, I assume that one of the appellant's positions is the whole reason he created the shape of this lot, which included that whole piece that runs along, you know, encompasses what is now the bike path. Mm -hmm. And the reason he granted an easement to the public to use the bike path, but at the same time reserved a right of access over that same strip is because the plan all along was for this to be a building lot. I mean, that's been the plan all along for this, this area to be building lots. I mean, th these were streets that were laid out. These were lots that were chopped up. At one point they were a certain size, now they're another size. But yeah, that was the idea all along to reserve the right through there to build on this property. And, um, and that's why it was specifically reserved to the right to access it. Now, the city goes and in one hand says, we love your bike path. Thank you for accepting. We would love it. We accept that easement. We, that's great of you. And we're going to deny your access that you specifically reserved that. I mean, it just comes off to me as, as same, frankly unfair. The city was granted that easement for no consideration or nominal consideration. And they accepted it with those specific terms that, um, that those rights were reserved to access across it. They, so, so my question on this, I'm sorry to cut you short, but that um, it assumes you already had that right to access and you had a right to access as was uh, a, like according to zoning. So I, I don't know that you were, you've lost any of that. You may not ever have had it. Like, do we know what access to you know, vehicular access you actually were approved for that you're potentially going to lose now. I mean, I could go drive up and down the bike path right right now. Um, no. and the city couldn't stop me. No, you can't. No. It's non-motorized only. Uh, I, well, I, I could with the permission of the owner. I could go drive up and down it right now with my car. 
I think um, your point is the owner owns that land. Y- yes, and, and specifically reserved the right. And when you grant an easement, sometimes you grant somebody an easement to say put power lines and their power lines may obstruct <clears throat> your whatever. But in this case, we specifically reserved in that grant of the easement for the, the bike path, specifically reserved the right to vehicle access so that the city could not stop that access. The city can't say, well, this is a bike path. You can't drive there. You say, no, city. We reserved that right. And that but is what, very specific in there. But the issue before us is, is the required frontage on a public way. And I think, again, that the city has accepted this as a public, the public can go up and down this way. Oh, and yeah. specifically, the owner has reserved the right specifically that they can use it as a, a, a for vehicles also. But I as think, far as a public way, I don't think there is any requirement that it, you know, if the public has a right of access, it's a public way. Well, that's the question. Yeah. But Carolyn, can you, I'm having trouble in the ordinance. Where is that definition? It's not under general definitions of public way. Because the ordinance is, is our Bible. Um, Carolyn, right. where did you find the definition of public way? So um, it's not an ordinance thing. It's a statutory thing. So there's a, oh, there, oh. There's a couple of things. So there's, there's, a public, there's a public access, which was granted, and we wanted it for the purposes of a bike path. And yes, we also have reserved for maintenance vehicles, trucks and cars, because we need to be able to meet to access for that yeah, purpose like access and, doesn't make it a public way is the question right that's right and so um the other thing about the owner of course the owner reserved a right to access with their vehicles because of course um a, a the same way that the city wanted access for maintenance vehicles that could be granted that's not the same as saying you have legal building frontage and lot frontage and therefore that because just because you called it single family home access doesn't mean you have a legal building lot it means that you're reserving the right to access your property w- with a vehicle and so the question with i mean this um additional question even after you get past um you know i think that there's Clearly, the city would say, yes, you can come onto your property with a vehicle. That's a different analysis as to whether or not you can have a single family home that has 10 trips a day that goes back and forth on the same bike path that the city built with city funds um, and whether or not that's an appropriate, um, you know, um, layered use of that easement. But that's even after the question about whether there's a legal building lot there. So anybody can write into their easement when they're granting to the city. I want to be able to do X, Y, and Z. That doesn't mean legally under other statutes like zoning and the Wetlands Protection Act that you are actually allowed to do all those things. Right. That's where I think there's a disconnect. I mean, my, my take on this is there's no question that the appellant owns the land that the bike path is on the appellant granted an easement to the city to allow essentially the bike path usage. The appellant reserve the right to use the same strip of land despite the grant of the easement to the city for its own access to this locus. But, and may have intended that to mean that that's going to make my this this parcel a buildable lot, but the question remains: Does all of the four above that I just listed mean that the appellant also has the required minimum frontage on a? Um, um, a a pr- you know, the appropriate, pu- the the uh, the public way as defined by the statute and as required by the zoning ordinance. And Carolyn, you had mentioned that public way is defined by statute. We're in several places. Uh, can I just um, ask you for those specific references? Because I, I haven't found anything that um, excludes this, um, and, and I would like to um, look at that if 
perhaps I'm missing something, but from everything I've found that this is not um, excluded as a public way in any Well, see, I think you're manner. using public way in, in sort of the broadest sense to suit, you know, and support the, the creative arguments that you're making. Um, but the, what's elusive here is what is the correct definition of public way for purposes of the analysis and the decision that this board needs to make. Um, and I, I'm not sure right now what the answer is. Did we just get all these exhibits and so on today? That's when I first saw them. There was just some that were part of the application and okay. so they were duplicative of the application, but they were- um, But the think, vast bulk of them just came today. But did the decision, the case decision come in today? I mean, I know it was- I, I had like, listed it, but I didn't actually, I, yeah. I had listed it in my original, um, but I didn't actually, or may, I may have included it. And, um, and just, I, I don't I, recall for sure. I know you don't need to do this for us, but did you shepherdize that case? Are there subsequent cases or- is that the I only mean, case I've, on point? That there's, you there's multiple different cases that talk about this. That's what I thought was most on point to this. I mean, there are right. lots of different cases that deal with all these issues. Um, what is a public way? What is not? What is on the accepted list of, of public ways? And what is an ex a public way by, because of um, the way it's... And I, I, this was the, what was on, you know, not giving this to, to um, you know, the land court. Um, I tried to get the, the most on point. Um, case and, and present it. And certainly I'm sure there are, are hundreds I, I, of cases I, in Massachusetts dealing with what is or isn't. Um, I, I personally would would really like to have more time to digest this case and see if there's anything out, else out there. But, but that's just as an aside for now. I mean, I do come back to where this all started. And that was a, um, a decision by the uh, building commissioner determining that um, it's not a building lot because of, an, of, of a lack of frontage on a public way. I mean, every word in that sentence becomes critical to the, uh, the analysis that we, we, we're being asked to make. Um, and I understand 100% the developer's you know, viewpoint and that of the, the, the people who were hoping and planning uh, to build on the lot. But uh, that's a about all I can say for now, because I'm, I'm uh, there's a lot to digest here. So the subdivision control law, which is the uh, 41, chapter 41, deals with the creation of public ways. So when, and for the purposes of frontage, frontage is about building frontage on a public way. And so that goes back to then the definition that's incorporated into our zoning about what that frontage means. And it's a way on which the, um, planning board has determined is adequate. The whole purpose is for adequacy of access is why we have frontage. And so the adequacy of the access from um, a public way, and it's not just um, a path that's, that has a public easement where the public has the right to pass and repass, that doesn't make it a public way. So all of our bike paths in Northampton, they're not public ways. Right. They are public just, trail. Just because an easement has been acquired by the city to allow right. the public to ride bicycles on them does not make it a public way. That I think is a critical question. And you're saying from your standpoint, it's not a question, it's, it's an answer. It's not a public way. Um, it has to do with safety and access, right? Of right. fire and, and uh, but this, emergency yeah. vehicles and utilities, but, snow removal. But what but what attorney Sosowski is suggesting is that the driveway satisfies that. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's no question okay. about it. You, so I mean, you so can the drive question is whether the drive said, though. so. But then the question is, is the driveway a public way? Well, but also it's not up to the property owner to make the determination about whether right. the adequacy has been met. I, I'm just it's trying, a planning board. No, I understand that. And I wasn't okay. suggesting that argument was correct. I was just trying to flesh okay. out what the argument yeah. was. Yeah, and I think as opposed to all other bike paths, perhaps in, in, in Northampton, this one is different, where specifically we did retain that right. So I, I can't go drive down a bike path, you know, uh, uh, off of Damon Road, whereas the owners of this can go drive down this. 
that's, I, I think, a critical difference that's maybe not quite um, appreciated in that we specifically have right. that right, whereas you don't, you know, uh, you don't have that right elsewhere. And that access, the purpose of access, you know, as people had pointed out, you know, the city drives their trucks up and down for maintenance of this. The, the city can go and, and maintain the bike path. The city drives here and drives there on it. Well, that, I think that shows that, that this, this is adequate for access to a single family home. I mean, we're not talking about putting a Walmart in here. It's, uh, you know, uh, you know, a couple people that want to build a home and, and want to do it and, and move to, you know, um, Northampton and are, are desperate to, to do that. And they're, you know, kind of looking at this, this board for, for help. And I think, you know, the purpose of this layout was always that these were lots and this was always designed and destined to be building lots. You know, if you look at any, any subdivision, anytime a home is built, well, why wasn't there a house there before? Well, because before there wasn't, um, you know, every time you build a house, that's the way, you know, it is these, th this has been progressing down that street. If you look on the other side of the street, just slightly before there are, you know, new homes going in there. Now if we talk about attic, you know, adequacy of access. They're right there. The street is being built out. I think it's uh, um, the, just the way things progress in, in the world. Um, and but, as Northampton gets, you know, a greater population, that's going to happen. And that was the design of this plan that these would be built out. And why, I think why not go to the planning board with an app, a subdivision application to extend Grove Avenue in accordance with subdivision standards? Cause that would ensure, I mean, I, I, I lost you when you said, uh, because the city can take a truck on the plan, on the, on the bike path, that means the bike path path is satisfactory for purposes of access addressing you know all the concerns of the city a fire truck cannot go on that bike path to access your house and that's one of the things that the city would always try to regulate um, but i think a fire truck getting to 88 grove is no different than a fire truck getting to whatever this would be 90 um you know how, how much different is that uh, 50 feet up the road if there's a concern with that then um well, that comes up in every application and we hear from the fire department saying no we have to be able to turn our truck around i mean that happens it's not the width of a bike path i'll tell you that much but but just as an alternative doesn't it make sense to go to the planning board with a new survey to extend i know that you're trying to avoid that by making all of these arguments to us but um I think it becomes cost prohibitive, uh, uh, you know, when you've got to start doing all this for one lot, essentially, and, and it becomes really cost prohibitive and, and Mr. Uh, and Ms. Mateo, they just won't be able to um, probably Well, I'll tell you one thing, that the, and, the, the planning board would have to approve whatever you were going to do if we did grant the relief you're requesting. I mean, it's it's not the wild west out there. Um, and I suppose that would come up when you go for a building permit. Um, I know you already did. I imagine that's why you're here now. But, uh, but issues relating to satisfying the, the requirements of public safety would, would absolutely come up. Um, but I hear what you're saying is, yeah, but you still don't want to go through the subdivision of, of, of approval process. But... I'm just putting that out there because um, I think the arguments you're making are 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 impressive um, in terms of um, of. Uh, I mean, another uh, one I we haven't got to. I mean, uh, frankly, uh, a lot on this, and I don't think I've addressed this. It was in my um, in my package that I submitted. They they granted a building permit. The city has granted a building permit to the McCarthys, and, and if we look at the, I can. Um, that's exhibits. Um, is that E? E like elephant. Now they you, you don't have a map on here to sh oh there is a map so that's lot nine on this map. It's shown as the first page. So if you can see where that is, so we're 12. Lot nine was granted a building permit. When when was that? Um, the permit is dated 12502. 
Carolyn, do you have any comment on that? And where is their driveway? I, they did not build, um, it, it appears the applicant was in a state and I'm not entirely certain what happened with um, whether there was, you know, the, lacked the agreement amongst the, um, the heirs of the estate or what happened, but they did um, apply for um, and were granted a, a building permit for that lot. But they I'm never seeing, built. I, I'm seeing the application. I'm not seeing the approval. Am I missing it? You're in the file for the that I'm, lot. I'm in what was Exhibit E, and I see the map on top, and then I see it um, is uh, all the way on the bottom. I squiggly something, P A T L L O subdivision approval. Tony Oh, Tony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One twenty-eight oh two. Action has been taken. But he checked off subdivision well, it says, approval. It needed subdivision approval from the planning board which is exactly what I'm recommending here. Um, Checked off. And wait, let me check. So I'm, yeah, so it's saying no legally. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry I had, uh, and that's what I wanted to discuss with you. And they, so they were granted previously, which is it, frankly even con more confusing um, where it didn't go through it. Oh, that's the one where it didn't go through. Cause that one says yeah. additional permits required, see below, no legally approved frontage, same issue as us. Subdivision approval from planning board is required as well as per the other permit required. So yeah. January yeah. 28th, 02. Right. And so, we, so they had gotten a permit previously, uh, however, um, on that. And, and it's frankly- but, but the permit couldn't be used. They couldn't start building until they got that approval. David's right. Yeah, all I know is that January 28th, 02 is exactly the same situation before us where the building inspector said there's no legally improved frontage, other permit required, subdivision approval from planning board, which is exactly what I'm suggesting in this case as the, as the, the appropriate um, pathway. But I realize it's, there's an expense to, and time to that. Because it's the planning board that looks at these issues of what constitutes safe uh, access, safe roadways, safe frontage. They get input from public safety, police, fire, and um, that's what we, that's what they do. Um, I do have a question, Carolyn, for you though, in, uh, in the- uh, I'm not ahead. sure Carolyn's here right now. Oh, um, did we lose her? I, I'm oh. here. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry, Carolyn. That's okay. Um, I know we're going to lose you briefly. Was that at seven, Carolyn? Um, I already took care of that, so we're oh, good. Thank Great, thank you. So, Carolyn, when I'm looking at the um, the memo we received, that's why I asked where is the definition. I see some notes that say frontage is defined as, and then I think you read this earlier. Yeah. But the uninterrupted length of the front lot line, which conforms to the minimum lot frontage requirement. That's the footage and is on, these are ors, A, a public way or way which the city clerk certifies as maintained and used as a public way. Not just a public way that's being called a public way because there was an easement granted to ride bicycles on it. B, a way shown on a previously approved subdivision plan, which, which we have a previous subdivision plan. I don't think it was approved in 1908 or 1948. Uh, which has been constructed to the standards required when subdivision approval was granted. So again, it's all about a way that satisfies the safety standards and specifications of the city or a way that predates subdivision control uh, that has, which again, arguably that might be that earlier date, at least 1908, not 1948, that has in the planning board's opinion suitable width grades and construction adequate and reasonable for vehicular traffic, including emergency vehicles and snow removal vehicles and installation of utilities. When I look at those, and we can find out the origin of these definitions, um, but when I look at these, you can see why I'm feeling such a huge gap between the public way frontage definition required in the materials we have and this argument that 
well, this is a public way because it's a bike path, which was an easement granted to the public to ride bikes. And, and none of the, and even if you're gonna make the argument that, well, it's our land, we can build on it. There's that gap in between uh, your land and where the existing accepted compliant roadway ends. So I don't know if you want to comment. That was long winded, but I don't know if you want to comment on that. But that's one of the problems I'm having. Yeah, I actually wanted to just point out I had um, I just attached and I just sent to Carolyn. I don't know if she's able to see an email I just sent her moments ago with a 98. Um, apparently it didn't attach earlier. It's a 98 approval of uh, a permit on, on building lot nine or on parcel nine that was um, granted to the McCarthy's. I'm noticing on that, um, that application that Tony Patillo signed saying it needed further looking at by the, by the planning board that those lot lines are quite different. At some point between 2002 and when uh, the uh, Beaver Book nominee trust did the gigantic subdivision and there was a negotiation with the city and all of those conservation easements and the bike path, et cetera. Um, at some point, chunks of the paper street were transferred to ownership and became part of lot 12. I, I don't believe that's the case. Hmm? I don't believe that's the case. You um, looking at your exhibit. Um, the funky you, one, the Nebraska shaped one. Uh, for Oklahoma. Well, lots of them are in Nebraska. Yeah. And, um, and again, I think what, what the actual fee interest is and where what some sketches showed uh, are not necessarily always, um, they don't always mesh perfectly. I think as David knows, sometimes you look at um, a survey doesn't necessarily match the state's- uh, Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, yeah. Tax map. Yeah. And, and I think that the fee, yeah. I, from what I understand, the fee has always been owned by this lot 12 in that, if we're gonna call it Nebraska or what uh, have Well, you. say looking at your exhibit E. I think it's Oklahoma. Yeah, and, and again, I don't know where that map comes from on that. It's a former uh, assessor tax map. tax map. And you're by you're talking to three lawyers and an engineer here. So we you know, I read these things and study them. And so at some point there was a transfer of ownership to the owner of lot twelve, not to the owner of eleven or thirteen or nine or I don't believe so. I think that just this map that we're looking at in, in E has got Grove Ave going right through there. And that's what the city said it was. I mean, that was a city map, a city tax map, and that was the city tax map. They said, there's Grove Ave, goes right through all the way through here. Yeah. And at some point they've kind of changed their story maybe um, um, as to that. Transfer of land from ownership of the city to at some point lot 12 became contiguous I, with and owns it now, according to the uh, the ANR plan. Yeah, and, and I don't believe there was ever transfer of ownership. It, that's showing because Grove Ave, essentially, if you think of it, really any property you own to the center of the street, the street isn't actually mm -hmm. owned by a city. You own to the center what? of the street, and every street is a right of way. Uh, 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 no. No. Yeah, well, not, not yeah, in the, Mass the, Highway or municipal. Uh, I guess a uh, city high, uh, a state yeah, not highway. State, not state, but we'll say but, every but, every local street here. Yeah. You go into the center of the street, and people will say, "Well, that's the town's tree." Well, not exactly. Sometimes when it's your, it's your tree, but the town's got an easement. The easement. I mean, uh, um, the city owns to the really essentially nothing on on most roads. Where they do own occasionally on a. a a state highway or or a, a interstate highway, but every street, you know, the building I'm sitting front in front of, you own to the center of the of the road, and the the, okay. the house on the other side also owns to the we center. Better, of the road. We better shift the argument away because you know, uh, 25 years of in, of civil engineering uh, doesn't that doesn't I get that's not computing for me. So let's go <laughs> I think back. David to understands argument. my argument yeah, on he's, that. He's yeah, well, he's talking about the derelict fee statute. 
but, but we don't want to get into that now. It, it, okay. it has to do, Sarah, with definitions and, and semantics and so on. And I'm not sure it's productive to get into that. Uh, Joe, you're talking about the derelict fee statute. Yeah, yeah. referencing that generally, whereas yeah. I, I don't believe this, the, the fee interest in this road was ever the city's. The city said, and according to that map, we've got our, the road goes through there. That's where our but, easement is. So your Grove Ave is shown on the ANR plan on exhibit D, that Grove Ave. The city doesn't own the land underneath Grove Ave in any point on Grove Ave anywhere. The, the homes on either side of it own the land underneath it. Yeah, I don't think we have to get it. I think the point Sarah was making is we see a discrepancy between this assessor's map, which suggests that the city, that Grove Ave goes right through your locus and your plan, which shows that that same strip of called Grove Ave and the assessor's is, is your locus, it's part of your locus. But I'm not sure where, where, where that takes us anyway, except confusion about the, these plans. A good point. We want to get back to, as David is very good at keeping us on track as far as what is the question before us. In, in general, um, you know, we, we need housing. It's a nice, maybe it's a very nice spot for a house. The question is, can we allow it? Uh, I did, let me just uh, mention that I did pull up the map. The lot I was thinking of um, uh, from some years ago, Carolyn may remember, was at the end of Kimball Street. And um, so that, and and as uh, Elizabeth noted, there's a, a house with this long, skinny flag pole, and they ended up having to get frontage at, on Hillcrest in order to use it. They couldn't use the end of Kimball 50 foot width as their frontage. I mean, I always thought that was like, what lawyers call black letter law in the zoning context that you can't use the end of a street to satisfy a frontage requirement. Um, but and that's what we decided in Dewey Court. Mm -hmm. And and so I believe the, their argument is that uh, it's not just the end that it's still away. Yeah, that's not even a but doesn't even abut the end. It's it's so many feet away from the end of. But again, it all turns on what, what we're calling a public way. Right. I think it's not, if, if you yeah. say the public way is the street that was accepted, that's so, as much as 37 feet away from the appellant's locus. And that's what a, that's what a public way is. It's not because the public can ride their bikes on the bike path portion. That doesn't make it a defined public way. Right, for these purposes. What, what is the source, Carolyn, of the material in our memo that says frontage is defined as, and the purpose of requiring frontage is to ensure adequate and safe access from a street uh, to a private pro property? Yeah, so um, the zoning stipulates what frontage is, but it is taken and mirrors the subdivision control rules and regulations. And there, there's definitely lots of case law about um, frontage and adequacy of the access. Um, and, and so, you know, if you, even if you were to accept that um, this paper street could potentially constitute um, a way it's not, it's not been approved by the planning board as a way um, for the purposes of creating frontage. So what, so would the mechanism, what would the mechanism be if we, we and I think it has to be a unanimous vote. I'm just, this is purely hypothetical. If we were to vote to overturn the building inspector's denial, what is the mechanism to ensure after that, that this, the, 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 the access, which would be over, I mean, how do you get from, from the end of Grove Avenue to the new house they're building in a way that will satisfy the city's and public safety requirements, which is just like procedurally. Yep. Subdivision um, approval. So you, so, you so what happens submit when they go a for a section, building? I know, you I know submit but, a, who, who, but who tells them they have to go for subdivision approval if we, if we overturn the building inspector? I just wanna hear, think through the different scenarios here. Um, so they could, um, 
they could they don't necessarily need to go to the building department to file subdivision for five, you can anybody can submit a subdivision application to the planning board it doesn't it's not a building permit process it goes to the planning board so someone um in this scenario would put together plans showing compliance but you're with saying voluntarily rules. what would force them to do that to ensure safe uh, the installation of safe and sort of compliant access well, the, right because the building if we if we were to overturn the decision essentially we're saying that we believe there is frontage right yeah i'm just for the right. sake of argument what's the scenario so then what what so if you overturned um uh if you oh if you overturned the building commissioner's um ruling and it would have to be unanimous um uh then you would be saying you either you think that it um uh it does have frontage because it meets the frontage definition of frontage um or i suppose you could say it could meet the definition of frontage but the planning board has to make that determination um but i think probably the cleaner way is to uphold the building commissioner's determination because the building commissioner looked at it and said this doesn't meet the definition of frontage therefore i can't grant it he didn't say there's no way ever to figure out a way to do that he didn't say you need a variance he didn't say anything he just said well i mean you could go through the variance process and say i don't, I don't need frontage but at any rate he was just making the determination that it didn't meet the frontage requirements so that doesn't bar someone from then going to the next step. Okay, how do I create frontage? And the way from the beginning of the 1940s till now, the way to create frontage is subdivision. Right. Okay. And again, I think that goes back to our argument. And uh, and Carolyn, I had sent you an, um, an email of a zoning permit where the, the grant in 98 for parcel nine, um, I just sent that to you a moment ago and I've got it here if anybody wants to see. Um, is that so, the same property that you same were, property? Yes. Yeah, so we were talking about where it before. says that they need subdivision of, and, but it was granted and they had frontage in this. Now, what happened? I, I don't know, and it's conf frankly confusing with the city how you could grant a permit uh, and then deny it later. Um, but yes, there was granted and it was frontage, and the city made a determination that this road was frontage for parcel nine. Right, but and, four years later, it's also it been a mistake. Bad. Yeah, so. four years later, it was denied. So I, I'm not sure, again, we should, that might be another red herring. I think I think we should just focus on this locus. Um, I mean, I, I think it is important when, when um, the, you know, the city granted it for, based on the same street, the same um, paper but then street. Four, but four years later, they denied it. So doesn't yeah, that and, kind of- Yeah, and I think it had happened. Probably because they really they thought it was a mistake when they came back for a building permit or something. I don't know. Denied it on the exact same terms that this building commissioner denied with with this locus. Um, any other questions from the board? This is there's a lot to digest here, but uh, we do. I think we have people members of the public who want to comment also. Uh, Just um, one thing I'm I'm noticing is you're you're talking about. Uh, process and uh, perhaps consequences of overturning is that there are um, additional lots that by this reasoning would now have frontage, such as 8, 9, um, 11, right. 31, everybody else down there. And, you know, maybe it would make sense for those folks to, you know, get together and try to do something, but um, it does it does bother me when you know language changes and rules change and somebody who bought a building lot you know as an investment or someplace to put their retirement home now has can't do it and no value so that always bothers me but um, and I think is, that's again that is, the, the reason that the courts oh I'm sorry but that's uh, and and that's also part of why we as the zoning board are just determining and why I don't make the rules. Oh, but I think that's what the courts have looked at. And, and that's why this paper street is such an issue that once somebody does buy a lot on this paper street, they can rely on that. And they can't say, well, okay, 
now we're we're changing the rules. You bought this, and and even though that paper street was was there before the current rules, you know these lots were owned by individuals that did buy them for whatever reason to build on them. I assume they bought them to build on them. Well, doesn't that raise an issue for your client, Joe? And that is that that same paper street on paper, as you and I know, gives people to the north. I think you're referring to them. Other other people rights to cross right through your locus. At least four, maybe six other lots. Yeah. Well, they, you know, it, it is possible at some time in the future they could look at that, but they don't have the vehicle access that this one does specifically retained in the, um, in that grant of easement. I but found they, it very have... difficult on that paper. I'm sorry, on the uh, paper street to really like lock it up against a current map to actually like confirm whose lot is what. It just feels like a lot, so much has changed in terms of those lots that as you described, like, like which numbers you thought were reflective of this property. I, I, I... It would be really helpful to see the, the currently approved subdivision plan with the lots laid out, and to your point, Maureen, um, with like an overlay of this, the layout of this paper street. I think, is that what you're saying? Um, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, let's, okay, let's, but, you know, I realize that paper streets are weird things and real estate lawyers are afraid of them all the time because, because they could, they created rights on paper. But I'm also concerned that if we were to overturn the building inspector, it kind of feels like we're completely undermining the whole purpose of the subdivision control statute, which, which is to, uh, uh, help to ensure public safety in terms of the uh, quality and adequacy and safety of 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 a of a of a route of access from a street to a private lot. But so those are the things I'm struggling with. But I think maybe we should try to move on uh, to let members of the public comment. Unless there are more, of course we can we can ask questions later. We're not closing the hearing. Um, is that okay with the board members? If maybe we give the public who've been very patient through this discussion um, a chance to comment. Unless just, um, Mr. Uh, Attorney Sosowski's client wanted to say anything, but otherwise I agree with that, David. Can I just add one other thing that, you know, that people, folks can mull, including the uh, um, appellant, that I think the LeBlanc case also said um, that, um, the parties within that, even though maybe the paper street control doesn't say anything about the city's ability to require the improvements to meet the standards uh, or the construction of the way. So um, I just, I wanna make sure that that is um, reevaluated because wrapped into that case that is central to their argument is that they still get to use this. But I think that case also said but it still needs to meet the standards that the planning board might have. So. Well, I think that case means that they can't be denied their building permit. And if the city's got other, uh, you know, other things that the city does, then that's what, you know, the city does, but they, they can't be denied their building permit on that basis. That just because it hasn't been constructed as of this point, doesn't mean the city gets to say, no, we're just denying you. Um, it doesn't supersede all city regulations. Um, I think is that's what it means. Right. If um, I mean, again, that's why I was asking before about the mechanism. If we were to overturn the building commissioner, um, could we have a condition to our decision requiring requiring the appellate to go to the planning board? They are the experts at this. The planning board to uh, have the authority to verify that frontage standards um, and any work that's done satisfies the frontage standards of the planning board. Or is, that's what I was getting at, or, or does that not really work a mechanism like that? I don't see how we can 
how, how the planning board could have jurisdiction over that if we make a determination that it meets the frontage. And that's what we would have to determine in order to overturn, right? I think not the about the frontage. It wouldn't be about the frontage. It would be to ensure that the that the, the rest of the project, the house and the means of access to the house uh, have to be constructed in accordance with standards that satisfy the planning board and the fire department and the police department. Go ahead, Carolyn. I was just gonna say, I don't, I don't think that would be a condition necessarily that you would place and it may sound like a little bit like I'm backtracking, but I think the central issue is either you're, you're holding up the determination by the building commissioner that he can't find that frontage is being met, but the planning board can either by reviewing a subdivision or evaluating the facts on the ground and saying, oh, this does meet adequate access and safety for, you know, and, and they could review the ground and say, okay, nothing needs to be done because this is a public, um, this meets the definition of a public way, or they need to go through, I mean, it's our representation. I think they need to go through subdivision approval because there's no improvement past the point that's been accepted. But I think the bottom line is your jurisdiction is to say, did the building commissioner err or not? Well, can we, could we flip it to the planning board without making a determination? Uh, no. Okay. Um, so I think, or do we, should we hear from members of the public if other people would like to comment? And I'll ask that anyone who does speak, uh, first of all, either raise your hand, is that how it works, Carolyn? Or, yeah. um, and then electronically, you, uh, and then Carolyn, the reaction button. And then Carolyn will what, unmute? You'll unmute that person? I, everyone has the ability to unmute themselves. So if you want to call on them and then they can unmute, um, that would be helpful. I can also assist if people are having to. So okay. you might want to explain where the raised hand function is, Carolyn, in case people don't know. There should be a reaction button on the lower portion of the screen. Um, for the people who call in, um, who have called in and want to raise their hand, I believe it is star nine. Um, people on Zoom, if you go to participants, it will show up. If you click on participants, it will show up at the bottom of that, right? That's where um, mine is. No. That's where mine is. Yeah. Oh, I, I see. think. Yes. It, yeah. So, click, um, yeah. Just um, procedurally for the meeting, it's uh, 10 after 7. Um, we have various options as a board. We can ask for more information. We could continue um, or we could close the hearing and make a decision. Um, I just want to say those out loud as those are the possibilities. Right. We could also take a little break. Uh, at least the board members have not been able to take a break. I don't know, I guess. But uh, um, why don't we get started? I will ask that anyone who wants to speak identify your, your name and address for the record that, that is being kept. Um, and again, address questions or comments to, it doesn't really matter, we're virtual, but to board members. I think um, we should be asking just for the town, not the address. Is that right, Carolyn? No, that's, City Council has devised that as their preferred yeah, mechanism. Okay, this, this, It's important because um, yeah, it really know. relates to the proximity of the proposed project. So you okay. want to get a sense of where people are in relation to. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Does anybody want to speak? And Carolyn, you may have to help me. If, I might not be able to tell or see if somebody wants yep. to speak. Um, I don't see any raised hands. If someone wants to chat to me or um, Elizabeth to say they want to say anything, or if they want to turn on their screen and just wave their hands, they can do that. But, um, and if, I, not, if not, that's okay too. I mean, we don't yeah. want to, um, we did get a letter while we're waiting, Carolyn, tell me if you see something. Uh, we did get a letter, which I assume now is in the file, Carolyn, that you sent us today. 
Um, uh, yes, from Deb Jacobs. Yes, that's in the right. online file. Okay. Um, I, so I don't need to read that letter. I, I, I suppose no. I, could, I could just summarize it in a sentence. It's from Deb Jacobs, yeah. and she uh, is writing in support of the building, in support of the commissioner's denial of the building permit. Um, for safety reasons, it makes no sense to consider the end of the street that is narrower than most to constitute frontage. And then she talks about policies apparently of the Leeds Massachusetts postmaster. Um, but that, that, that is available in the online file, correct, Carolyn? Yes. Uh, uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe we can move on if there's no one. I, I want to make sure we're not missing somebody who wants to talk. But I Someone see just, Rose Bookbinder. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm um, just driving back from work. Um, I, I Rose Bookbinder. Um, I uh, grew up at 88 Grove Avenue um, and currently co-own that um, with my mom, but I also reside in Haydenville, Mass, um, just up the road. And I just wanted to speak um, also um, in agreement with the building commissioner's um, denial of this project. Um, as someone who grew up on that street, I'm pretty aware of just uh, how uh, of a narrow road it is and you know all of the as Deb spoke in her letter all of the um, mailboxes were needed to be moved because it just was difficult just for the post office to be able to access the road and now with um, you know so many folks knowing about the area because of the bike path uh, there's you know been a lot of conversation about parking and it's been very congested there so um, you know I think that the property is you know, nearly 40 feet from the yeah, uh, improved way. And, um, you know, while, um, you know, I appreciate that folks want to, you know, enjoy that beautiful section of um, Northampton, just want to recognize that there would be, you know, extreme difficulty for public, for access of um, utility vehicles and um, also emergency vehicles. And, and just don't think that, that this proposed plan is, is appropriate um, for the end of, of the road. So just speaking um, in agreement with the building commissioner's decision. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any other hands? Uh, I don't see any, Carolyn, do you see any? No, oh yeah. Uh, Amy um, Bookbinder. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, hi. Um, I'm the last speaker's mother and um, I've been living here for, I think 37 years at 88 Grove Avenue. Um, and we've all seen a lot of increased traffic here. And the first thing I wanted to, to mention is that yes, the post office no longer delivers our mail because they declared the end of Grove to be too dangerous um, and without adequate space for their trucks to turn around. Um, and I also wanted to, I assume that you, you've had a, a site visit here, but if you haven't, or you have, you might have noticed that there are now um, no parking signs that were put up all along this section of Grove Avenue because of concern about the uh, dangerousness of increased parking here because it's narrow, not to, you know, not just, uh, you know, any old not wanting traffic, but because this is uh, a narrow street. Um, and those signs were put up by uh, the DW in coordination with the police department. So there's two other governing bodies in the city that also have concerns about safety here. And in addition to that, the city council is now considering an ordinance um, to make those no parking signs permanent because of the great increase of traffic um, since last summer with the, the growing popularity of the swimming area. 
Um, so, you know, there are several governing bodies here who, who are concerned and addressing the issue of safety here. And so that's my the first thing I wanted to say. And the second thing is, well, that was a, a big first one, but my second one, and maybe Carolyn, you can help um, explain this better than I could. But I believe that um, when I had my lawsuit years ago, it was determined by the judge uh, that Grove Avenue could not be extended beyond where it is now, which as Carolyn pointed out, is 37 feet away, um, you know, from the, from the spot in question. So uh, Carolyn, maybe you can address that further, but my understanding is that it was determined in that uh, court that it can't be extended. Um, you know, I'm sorry, I had to go back and reread the outcome of that case. Um, so, uh, but I don't, I mean, I think the issue still comes back to um, whether or not it needs, sub I think that probably relates to the fact that the adequacy hasn't been um, created beyond the points that the court determined was the accepted way. And so in order to overcome that, you go through the subdivision review process or the planning board review process and the planning board then stipulates what it, what's required to make that. So the judge may have said, it, you know, there's, it, it, it can't be accepted beyond this point because it's unsafe or I'm sorry, the words that you suggested, but, um, uh, that doesn't preclude someone from then applying to the planning board to make those changes. I, that's what my interpretation would be. But again, I haven't, I'm not familiar with that particular text from the decision. And are you able to say what the planning board's position would be on that? Well, would it uphold the, that, the court recommendation or is that unknown? That would be unknown. So someone would have to come um, to, um, would have to apply, show what the existing conditions are, show, you know, the existing extent of the improved way, um, and then um, what, what the conditions are between that point and this parcel and any proposed improvement by any prospective applicant. So it, I, I couldn't tell you um, without having, without reviewing a plan and the planning board couldn't say anything, I think, without reviewing a plan. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, anybody else who'd like to speak from the public? I don't think we see anyone now. So I think we can go back to uh, the board's analysis. The thing that I'm having the most trouble with is the reason for this frontage requirement is public safety. And as I understand it, if we were to overturn the building commissioner's decision, there is no mechanism to ensure that an access way is installed that will satisfy the, the requirements for public safety. I've asked the question a couple of times and unless I'm missing something. And whereas if we were to uphold it, it would essentially re require the applicant or the appellant to go to the planning board to, to do this correctly and have the plant get the planning board and the city's input on safe and effective access. I know that has nothing to do with the legal arguments that have been made. I'm just saying on a gut feeling in terms of the reason the zoning ordinance exists in terms of public safety and the reason we're here. Um, so that's just an observation. Um, any other 
thoughts from other board members. Uh, you're I think muted. You're, you're, you're muted, Elizabeth. I did that when we were listening to other people. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I have to say, I, I feel bad for the appellant here who, you know, perhaps has purchased this property in reliance on building. Um, you know, I, I know that you've outright rejected the idea of the subdivision, but uh, approval, um, work and approval, but I, I do think that is one way that this could still happen. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I do think housing and additional housing in this city is a good thing. I think that should be part of our fabric. Um, and I want to encourage this um, to go forward. But I, I, I also am very concerned about, um, you know, making sure that everybody's safe and, and that we, we meet the standards that are required. And I, I think I am comfortable um, in making the decision to uphold the commission's, the, the building commissioner's decision, because I, it feels like it's consistent across the different cases that we've seen um, on, on the zoning board um, and what we're, we're seeing from the appellant that, that that case that came up um, where it was very clear that there was a, a referral to the planning board and getting su uh, subdivision approval from the planning board. So, you know, I, I, for that reason, I mean, I, I think it makes sense to uphold the decision, but um, not without recourse to being able to move forward. Um, before someone else talks, I want to add a, an additional thought ad addressing the legal arguments. The, 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 um, they seem to rest on a couple of things, uh, aside from one case, which is only one case, at least that's been brought to our attention. One possibility, by the way, is to continue the hearing if the appellant has other authority to cite uh, beyond just the one case, but um, you know, and you, also you know, to find out what happened between in those four years between that exhibit E, That's yeah, two. yeah. But yeah. the um, I, I am impressed by the fact that in two thousand two, the then current building commissioner did exactly the same thing as this one, but um, but but the 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 the, the, the arguments seem to rest on one this truly ancient paper street from 1908, um, giving rise to rights. Two, um, I don't deny that, the, art, that the, uh, the, the owner of the locust, the appellant here has rights to have access to the lot because they were reserved in the easement that was granted to the city. But to me, that simply does not rise to the level of the required public way, quote unquote, as required for safety and and uh, purposes and public benefit. Um, so I just wanted to add that I didn't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm my own, my only thinking is that um, there's uh, there will be no way to ensure the installation of a of a of a means of access that complies with the 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 safety requirements of the city. It's also that that I, I'm not. I have a problem relying on a on a on a paper street from 1908 that has since been superseded how many times by subsequent planning by subsequent subdivision plans that have been approved by the planning board unlike the one from 1908 uh, that I don't think had any public approval that we can see on the face of it um, and then this again I'm repeating myself but this idea that to say that because you've reserved the right to have access to your lot that that um, and that the city has been granted more specifically an easement to allow bicyclists to use it, um, that that causes the status of this way to rise to the level of a public right, a public way that is the public way that we need to see or that is required 
to satisfy the requirement of frontage. I, I really fall down on, on that point, but I'll, I'll let someone else talk. Uh, either, and, uh, any other comments, Maureen or, or Sarah? Well, I liked Sarah's, you know, digression, slight digression about hoping that there's some possibility like um, numbers, maximizing numbers to consider that there's a couple of lots beyond their property that might make a subdivision more uh, financially possible. And then when I hear the book binders, and this is, you know, really just thoughts on what other options there might be for you. But that uh, when I think hear the book binders talk about the already tricky logistics about that street, if there might somewhere down the pike be the opportunity to partner with the city to do something at the end of that street that's not just subdivision, but a safer access to give up, give easement even more to a cul-de-sac, some turnaround, some way to make the street more navigable. Because at some point, the city will look at that street and realize we have to do something there. It's narrow, it's too narrow. So I just, I look to the future and think that there might be some other possibilities um, open for you that would make this um, potentially doable. And that's exactly what the planning board process uh, is for. I mean, I don't think that's an overstatement, but go, but, but uh, thank you. And, and Sarah, do you? Um, yeah, I'm just, um, um, what's been bothering me is something about the process, there was, it appears that there was some extensive negotiation uh, between either Hanley or Melnick with the um, uh, Beaver Brook, uh, that whole giant a &R, there's a lot of pieces to that, a lot of moving pieces that were negotiated, including that easement, uh, the conservation restrictions, the um, you know, what, what was the intent in there? Because as that easement was granted to the city, was the city not involved in that language that, that, um, that where the uh, easement was, was being granted with the uh, reserving the right to, you know, use it as a driveway or something. And then the fact that it came off of the paper street status and entered the tax rolls as part of this lot 12. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces in there over many years um, that uh, kind of muddy it for me. But when it comes down to the current frontage, I see 50 feet at the end of Grove Ave and that hasn't passed muster in the past with us. Even aside, even aside from the fact that arguably there's a there's a significant gap of twenty or thirty feet from that end of that fifty foot in Grove Ave. That to doesn't the particularly bother me. Uh, you know, if, if the pavement ends and yes, it's twenty or thirty feet. If someone was putting in a driveway, they would have to pay for that. If they were putting in utilities, they'd have to pay for that. Um, you know, the, the, exactly who owns the middle of the street um, uh, is, uh, uh, doesn't help me. The book binders own half, half of that grove, you know, it's, you know, which would restrict the driveway. It's, so this, the, it gets really muddy really fast when these, if, if, these, if these, all these arguments aren't taken separately. No. One at a time, maybe they work, but you stick them all together, and it's uh, it's it's a bit muddy. But you're coming, and I as think we've had uh, before that it's coming back to that fifty feet of frontage. And I want to be clear on that with all these arguments; they don't all fit. They they're not all together. They, these are alternate. They, essentially, I think our our best, simplest, cleanest, and uh, the easiest correct argument is that this is a paper street. There's frontage on it. Simple as that. We've got the frontage along this paper street. The other arguments are alternatively to that. 
but is I think that Paper Street feet? established. Oh, we've got lo- much more than fifty feet. Um, right, it runs the, the length. Street. Yeah, it runs, it runs the length of the Paper, the paper Street. Paper Street runs the length. Yeah, and that's why you're. So you're really hanging your hat on that case too, then. Yeah, I, I think case clearly that ancient Paper Street that was never developed can rise to the level of front can can give rise to frontage that mm-hmm. satisfies the requirements of the zoning ordinance and that's Boy. what that case says and and that case really supports our case and and the other arguments are essentially a, a alternate to that but i think I, if i'm looking at this correctly it looks like there's about 115 feet of frontage along the paper street um and and i think that that alone is, is all that's needed here and these other arguments, while well, maybe confusing, maybe um, are, are certainly alternate. And I don't think any other argument that I've, I've made needs to, to matter essentially besides that first one, which I think wins. And then these other ones, um, if for some reason you guys disagree with me, which I think would be a- against that um, appeals court case, then I think the other arguments do also make some sense in that there is truly um, the access in, and it is a public way. Has, has uh, the property owner, Hanley, and then Melnick as trustee, not been paying taxes on this funky shape, all that square footage of land, which is shown on the tax assessor map as belonging to that lot? I... And Can't it's surveyed as exactly. part of that lot. I haven't seen any survey that shows me uh, that 115 feet of frontage you're talking about. I don't see any, I haven't seen that anywhere that shows me that lot 5 12 has, has, has a line across the front of it that doesn't include what used to be Paper Street. Yeah, but that paper street is is, is 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 our argument is still there. That's a legal there are legal rights in that paper street. So it was the uh, ANR survey incorrect. I, I don't think it, it it supersedes or I don't think it erases those legal rights that are exist there. Although that's something not addressed in in your case that you cite. Yeah, I, I don't think this a and plan changes anything or supersedes anybody's rights. This is um, simply a surveyor, I think, saying this is what I see. And, and, and we don't disagree that we own the fee in that funny shaped lot, but we also say there is also this paper street that is there and there are other rights besides just the ownership in that. So taking your position in this case, uh, the city has no way to police the uh, safeness, the safety of the specifications for the installation of this access, because you just you can just build a house because well, your front because you have frontage on a paper street that does not exist. Well, I would say the this isn't certainly the you know the the building commissioner doesn't get to decide that there, if there is or isn't a, a frontage. Um, I would say that's what that case stands for, is that you can't deny this building permit based on the fact that that paper street is there and that those rights are there. Did, so how did, does it get determined if the building inspector is, is forced to grant the building permit? I mean, because <laughs> under this theory, there are paper streets, as you know, Joe, everywhere. People could just start building houses anywhere they want on because you know, on a landlocked piece of land because they have a paper street, rights well, I mean, over I, a paper street. I think it's similar to like a pre-existing non-conforming lot. You had those rights. They changed whatever, you know, the city changed the, the lot size therefore. And now your, your 40 foot lot that was um, an approved lot now it should be 50 if it were a new lot, but that pre-existing non-conforming lot still has those rights. It locked in those rights. And, and that's what that paper street did. It locks in rights. And now, granted, the, the, the zoning and these, these regulations, subdivision control, changed some of those things for things that happened after, but they didn't take away rights that had already been in existence at that time. They said, now, going forward, when somebody wants to build a new street, now they need 
these these approvals and whatnot, but these old streets that were there, these paper streets that were there pre-existing, these people that had rights in these streets, you, we're not taking your rights away. I think, I think frankly, it would be a, a, really almost like a taking if the city were to say, no, we're taking this frontage away from you on this paper street, this right that you have, and we're saying no. I, I haven't seen um, <clears throat> any, any uh, plan the ANR, now this is a stamped plan, stamped surveyor plan that uh, there's there's nothing that shows me that lot 5-12 has 115 feet of frontage on a paper street. I don't see that anywhere. You haven't shown me a, a survey plan that shows me that right. lot 5-12 is a school, is a rectangle. Right, that was my idea that if we could see a plan that that superimposed this street from the two, 1908 plan on the the final existing subdivision plan that that you've got. So it, it, it's, it's an my, interesting point, Sarah. How, how do we even know that the paper street is where you say it is? And how does yeah, the building inspector have could hey, there was nothing really for him to to even even if he agreed that the paper street was valid frontage. There's nothing that shows me that. He had no, he, he didn't have that a piece of paper in front of him that showed him that. And even the other question the existing non-conforming, um, when a pre-existing non-conforming asks for some new construction or building, they have to come for approval. It's not a slam dunk. You they know, there's procedure, survey. you know? Um, can I just ask another question? So the other thing I think about paper streets is you alluded to it before, you own both sides. Um, so when a paper street is not ever built and someone owns um, both sides of it, then that disappears and merges into the private property, which is actually shown on the plan that you've presented is it's one squiggly lot that has you know legs in different directions. And so, um, then where uh, from wh where are you have where do you have frontage along that because you don't have it across it on on both sides you don't take frontage on both sides of the street so um, I think there's more information that needs to be um, submitted about how the merger of ownership on both sides doesn't then just extinguish the paper street um, and as David, you mentioned previously that if many paper streets and um, they're out there and they're not legal frontage as we've continuously interpreted until someone were to apply to the planning board for subdivision approval to actually build upon that paper street um, and extend it. So um, I think there, um, lots of gaps about this argument that um, the paper, because it's a paper street, therefore it is until the end of time, um, can be can qualify for under zoning for um, frontage and then adequacy of access from that frontage. I'm also, yeah. That's very useful. Thank you, Carolyn. And also, yeah. I also might note that on that ANR plan, there's a reference to see note one where the surveyor notes a whole bunch of plans, books and page numbers that somehow uh, you know, gave him um, a clear understanding that the area of this lot is in big bold numbers, 30,479 square feet including what had been paper streets. I keep, try, I keep trying to read this decision because I, I didn't get the text of the right. decision until today. You know, I don't know if you want to continue, consider a continuance because uh, a couple of points have come up. I would really like to Research. digest this case and, and, um, and I don't know if you have other cases you want to submit or because if this is the only one out there, I don't know, but but um, and then if if we could see a plan, maybe you just don't want to go to this trouble. But if we could see the plan that's been 
kind of requested that showing the exact most recent currently developed or under development a subdivision plan and the superimposition of this paper street from 1908 that you're talking about. I think that could be very helpful. Now, maybe you don't wanna do that survey work. I, I appreciate that. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm saying that, you know, as it takes unanimous decision of the board to overturn the building commissioner's decision. And would it make sense to, you know, to, to submit some more information, any other cases you can find, the survey, the, the plan that's been described, uh, rather than us taking a vote now, um, I guess is a question. I, I guess I would add to that, that if that's a, that's a, a road that you want to follow, then I'm very curious about this other situation where there was a permit issued in uh, 1998, but then reversed in 2002 um, with a recommendation of what the building commissioner this time has recommended. So I-, I, or, I or if you can get more information about yeah, that, that might at, be right, persuasive. Anything. Stuff. anything. Um, and maybe take the time also to talk to any of the other folks that um, you know was suggested that own any of those other properties around the idea of doing the subdivision. It's, it, you know, well, I'm happy to leave that decision up to you, um, whether or not you want to do that and take that continuance for our, another to the next hearing and, you know, delay our final decision. I, I think there are three of us that have to come to that. Um, maybe, maybe not, but I'm, you know, if that's something that you'd want to do, I'm happy to go with that. Because I like David, I've been trying to run back and forth to read the decision and it's just, it's not getting in there. So, yeah. Um, and I realize that's more passage of time, but I, but I think if we were, I mean, you can kind of read the writing on the wall. If, if we have to make a decision now, I'm not sure it would be the one that you want. So we're, we're trying to sort of be helpful in a way. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I, I think that the, 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 you know, like I said, I, I think the, um, the paper street thing is, is there and that case supports that. Um, you know, I don't know if I do submit other things. Um, I think it's, we've got to have another hearing at that point. Um, I'm not sure if. Well, when could that be, Carolyn? That, uh, that, uh, I guess it would be the, sec the second Wait, Thursday have, in June. Yeah, uh, June 10th. Um, I am not available the 24th, but you had, do have June 10th and it's open right now. Um, so. That was another thing that I think we need to discuss was your summer schedule tonight. Um, huh. Because July and August obviously come after the June <laughs> 10th meeting. So um, we need to figure that out. But if June 10th isn't enough time, um, you know, I would say push it to July. Would June 10th give you enough time for notices? I don't think it has to be re-noticed, right? Because no. No, it's oh, a okay. continue, you continue okay. it to a date time Great. certain tonight, Great. and there's Great. no note, notice yeah. requirement. Yeah. I think we may have another. It, Pat, Pat Melnick, sorry, yeah. my, my name is Pat Melnick Jr. My name's wrong in the thing. Yeah. I, I can just tell you that if it would be helpful to you to see where, where the uh, Grove Avenue, uh, the, the Washington Heights plan was superimposed onto a current map, I can tell you we can we can do that. We can get that to you if that's helpful. But as, as far as your other requests, uh, I, I don't think there's going to be anything else we're going to be offering. Uh, the case that we're relying on has been submitted, and um, uh, you know the what happened between the uh, what was it uh, 1998 and 2002. I've I've already looked into it, and I, I honestly I can't find any reason for it um, why they denied it the second time after they denied uh, approved it the first time. Um, so, like I said, if, if it would be helpful to see the uh, Grove Avenue, uh, the Washington Heights plan laid out uh, over the existing it, plan. That... And Pat, that would enable, I just want to read the damn case. I've been trying to read it through the whole, and I know it's not that long, but you know what I mean. I, no, I, I, it's, it's, it's such dense. a critical case for you that I, I'd like to be able to focus on it. Uh, in I have case... no problem with, with it going to another date. It's, it, I guess what you want from us, it, it's, uh, I, can get, I can get you that, that's not a problem. But uh, the other requests I don't think will be helpful. So the two things, so, so I mean, it's your it's your your decision if you want to just ask us for a continuance. It clearly will agree will agree to it. Um, but to me, the two benefits, so we could see that plan that people have been asking for, 
so we can visualize where this paper street is. And so we can focus on that case and maybe some of us can do some of our own digging to see if we see anything else out there uh, relating to that case to confirm that in our mind, if that case is as definitive as, as, as you feel that it is. Um, that, that'd be fine. We, well, we, we would be happy to go to, we'd ask for you know, one more date then to take a look at those things. June 10th then maybe? So at 5.30, I mean, you don't have anything scheduled right now, so you can put it at 5.30. Um, I, I better just, let me, I'm just checking my calendar June 10th after all that. Um, sorry. Um, everyone else okay June 10th? I'm calling up my calendar. Yes, and I think if we start going beyond then we're gonna run into vacation issues and I think that that could be a problem. So yeah, I can do I can do June tenth. I'm not sure. I bet the appellant doesn't want to wait past then either. No, June yes. 10th I think is fine two weeks that. is fine. Okay. So uh, so I, I take it that that's a request for a continuance. And that is yes. a, our request for a continuance to June 10th. Yeah. Okay. And I get I, I think Carolyn, we need a motion and then a, a roll call vote. All right, so I move to continue this hearing um, until Back. June 10th at 5.30. 5.30 here, second, a second? Second. Okay, and then I, do we need, a, we need a roll call because it's virtual, right, Carolyn? Yep. So um, Elizabeth Silver? Yes. Um, Sarah Northrup? Yes. Uh, David Bloomberg? Yes. Okay. And does that work for you as well, Maureen, just in case something comes up? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so we'll, uh, and then Carolyn, you can communicate with Joe about, I mean, you'll, uh, if there are any further communications be between Carolyn and Joe. Right. And um, I'll, I, right. And so in the intervening time, no contact between the applicant and the board members um, or the members of the public um, that would be considered ex parte contact. So you, you, um, you know, um, any everything about this permit application or appeal, I should say, has to be um, discussed in the context of the public hearing. Right. So no discussion among any board members or what you just said. Thank you. OK, so so I think we can let these folks go. May, can I ask a question? Um, the person who spoke, whose name looks like Torin, yeah. I, you didn't identify yourself, and I'm sorry. I'm not. I don't know who you are. It's sorry, clear I, that I'm Pat, some other I, folks did. I'm Pat Melnick Jr. I, I, oh, okay. Thank you. No That's enough. Yep. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank uh, you. We'll talk to you again. Um, to the board, um, I need to run. Um, is there anything urgent that we have to do right now? Um, I just want to throw out summer schedule. We don't have to do it now. We can just, if you think about it, if you could email me and let me know second or fourth Thursdays through July and August, I actually just realized that I'm going to be away the fourth Thursday of July. So I don't know if you want to do like the first meeting in June, first meeting in July, first meeting in August, or I don't know if that works with your schedule. So I'm just throwing that out there if you could think about it. Um, and if you have to leave and then just email me, that's fine. Yeah, I, Could I you know just that. send that by email? Yeah, we yeah. can do this by email. Yeah. yeah. And then um, it sounds like we've chosen the first day of June, but um, yeah, available. Okay. Um, and then do we just need a motion? I think that's probably a motion to just to adjourn. Yeah. Is that it? We don't so, have any minutes. Move. Second. Uh, roll call. Uh, Elizabeth? Yes. Um, Sarah? Yes. Uh, Maureen? You sure? Yes. And David. Yep, yes.